in this video, I'm going to be talking about the structure of the antibody protein. You know, the CBM is very protein-centric. That is, we're really focused on protein structure and how you understand the principles of chemistry that drive proteins into these funny shapes. So I'm going to be using this physical model of an antibody here. <clears throat> see this articulated model? You see how flexible it is? This is a diff difficult protein to make a physical model of because it is, in fact, very dynamic and flexible. So what is it about an antibody protein that makes it particularly well suited to function in our immune system? And before we get into that, let me just say that I really don't need to do any of this because you now live in the age of the internet where all of the information about an antibody protein is right out there at your disposal. All you need to do is Google, uh, do a word search for antibodies in Google Image and you will you'll have access then to, I don't know how many, maybe as many as a thousand different images of antibodies, each one attempting to explain to you the structure of an antibody. So why should I be making a video then that tries to do that? The reason I'm making this video is that <clears throat> there's almost too much information out there so that if you're just beginning to think about an antibody, what is it, understanding how it works, it's sometimes difficult to sort through all of the, all that information and pick the one or two graphics that, uh, that introduce it in a simple way as you're beginning to understand the protein. So this video is just a, an, a, a, an effort to simplify that. And I've chosen a few images that you'll find in Google Images that I think are, are particularly well suited to explain this protein. And more than those images that I'll show you in a minute, I have the luxury of using a physical model of the protein. And one of the main things I want to point out here is that this protein antibody is a tremendous example of something that I like to refer to as the modular nature of an antibody or the modular nature of proteins in general. And what I've done here, I've just pulled off of this protein a piece of the protein, a domain, which we refer to as an immunoglobulin fold. Let me talk about this word immunoglobulin. Immunoglobulin is often used interchangeably with the word antibody. An antibody is an immunoglobulin. There's an immunoglobulin G, there's an immunoglobulin A, different classes of immunoglobulins. Uh, an Im immunoglobulin G is often referred to as an IgG. Ig is immunoglobulin and then G. So there's an IgG, IgA, IgM. Uh, you'll learn about all of these if you get interested in immunology. All right, but an antibody is nothing more than 12 immunoglobulin folds joined together in four chains there are two light chains shown in this model in this silver color. So a light chain is represented here. Each one of these is about 112 amino acids long. So a light chain is about 224 amino acids joined together. Here's another model then of an immunoglobulin fold. And what I like about this model is that you can actually separate it to see that it's that an immunoglobulin fold is made up of one four-stranded beta sheet here in blue, and then a five-stranded beta sheet shown here in green. And I don't know how well you can see this, but there are two cysteines, one in this sheet, one in this sheet. And in the final folded immunoglobulin domain, those two cysteines come together to form a disulfide bond that stabilizes the blue sheet opposite the green sheet. So that's the, that's the really remarkable structure of an immunoglobulin fold. And what's interesting then is that nature, having evolved this particular fold, and let me, let me stop and, and I want you to think about what that means. Where did this protein come from? This protein is just a sequence of amino acids, and it's encoded by a gene. All right, so nature evolved this gene, which linked together a sequence of amino acids, which 
then spontaneously folded into this particular shape with two beta sheets connected by a cysteine, by, by a disulfide bond. So that, that's an immunoglobulin fold. <clears throat> and when we talked about the modular nature of, of proteins, so once <clears throat> nature had evolved this particular fold, it went ahead then and used a series of these folds in a modular way to make an antibody protein. So there are 12 immunoglobulin folds that make up an antibody. There are two of them in each of the two light chains, so one, two, three, four. And then the heavy chain is made up of four of these. So there's one, two, three, four. So since you have two heavy chains, that's four times two is eight. Four more folds here, that's 12. 12 immunoglobulin folds is what makes up that antibody protein. And I find that just to be fascinating. Um, I'll just mention that there are other proteins that function in our immune system. There's something called an MHC protein, which, which also has a series of immunoglobulin folds in it. So it's interesting to think about the evolution. How did, you, how did we evolve these genes that encode these proteins that function in our immune system during that evolutionary process we came back over and over again to this particular uh, fold. One more point I'll make is that I don't want to give you the impression that the amino acid sequence is identical between each one of these. They're not identical. They're different in very important ways. They all fold up into this same basic two sheets connected by a disulfide bond. The two cysteines that make this disulfide bond are absolutely conserved through all of these domains. But they're different, and in particular, they're different right out here at this end of the variable domain of an antibody, because this is what changes, determines the specificity of the antibody for different antigens. So I'm going to switch now to another model of the immunoglobulin fold. But in this model, you can see that we've added all the amino acid side chains. And what I want to show you here is that if you look at the surface of this, you see lots of color. So these are polar or even charged amino acid side chains that are on the outside surface of this protein, which makes it soluble in the aqueous environment in the cell. But watch what happens if I separate the two beta sheets that make up this protein. And I want you to look in particular at these side chains right in here. You see all this gray carbon? These are hydrophobic side chains. So one of the principles of chemistry that drive protein folding is that there's a tendency to bury all of the hydrophobic amino acids on the inside of a folded protein where it minimizes their interaction with water. So that's one of the basic uh, principles of chemistry. I don't know how well you can see this, but I see right here a positively charged arginine side chain opposite a negatively charged aspartic acid side chain. I doubt that you can see that, but these are the kinds of details that you will be able to see in JMOL in a computer environment as you examine these proteins. And if that salt bridge is something that's part of an important part of the story you're trying to tell with your protein, then you would want to include those two side chains in the model that you're going to build.